All right, it's a pleasure to come back here this morning and be with you guys. You know, when you ask a missionary to come and, and preach from the Word of God, you can be confident that in one way, shape, or form, this message is going to lean towards missions. And it's going to this morning, as you will see. I was trying to, we're going to talk about prayer this morning, but I want to start by sharing with you guys a story from the jungles of Papua New Guinea, from living amongst the Kaje people group. And I don't want to tell a story that I've already told you guys, and I have so many different stories to tell. I believe here, last time I was here, I, I shared a story of how we prayed for the Kaje people to, to be able to sit together so that they would hear the Bible teaching the Lord used the death of a man to bring that unity back. I can't remember, have I ever told you guys the story of the dream that I once had in Kaje? Did I ever share that story here? Do you guys remember that? I see a couple heads shaking this way. Okay, I'm going to share this story with you. It's probably mid-2017. We're going to start the Bible teaching in mid-2019. So mid-2017, I've learned the language at this point. We're probably getting literacy ready, putting the letters to the sounds that they make. And I don't dream much, actually. i um, not a big dreamer. But this one night, I'll never forget, we were in our house and fell asleep. And I had this, the most vivid dream of my entire life. And the dream went like this. It was raining very, very, very hard outside, and my family and I, we were in our house in the jungle of Papua New Guinea, uh, up on this hill. We, are, we live on the only hill for, for miles around in the village that we live in. And in my dream, we were there in our house, and it was raining very, very hard, and somehow we knew that it was going to be a huge flood, like the water was going to actually wipe out, kill a lot of the Kaje people, and it was going to come all the way up and cover the hill that we were on. And somehow, you know how dreams work, somehow in this dream, I knew that if we could get, if I could get my family up into the rafters of our house, our house doesn't have a ceiling, you, you just see the you can see the angle of the roof and the metal roofing. I knew if I could get my family into the rafters of our house, somehow we would be saved from the waters of this flood. And so I took my oldest daughter, Jen. I said, Jen, climb up into the rafters. And she climbed up, and I grabbed Jaden, and I handed Jaden to Jen. And then I grabbed Max, and I handed Max to Jen. And Solo wasn't alive at this point. Just had these, just the two. And as I'm getting ready to climb into the rafters, I hear this banging. Down, down underneath our house. Our house is nine feet in the air on posts, so we have a stairs that go underneath. I hear this banging, and Jen looks at me, and she says, go down quick and see who it is. Maybe they can be saved with us. I run down the stairs, and the water is already under the house, and I go to open the door, and there's my dear, dear Kaje friend. His name's Ruira, and he's standing there, and the water's already up up covering the, the ground on our hill, and it's like, it's rushing by, and I grab this man, Ruira, by the wrist, and I say, Ruira, quick, come with me. If you come into the rafters of the house with us, you can be saved with us. And it's the most real thing ever. He, he took both his hands and put them on either side of my shoulder and kind of grabbed me like this, and with tears in his eyes, he said, John, this is not my time. I was not meant for this. And he pushed me back, and I fell into the water. And the water came and swept Ruida away. And I woke up. I woke up drenched in sweat. And I didn't know what the dream meant. And the Lord's never spoken to me in dreams since or before. Uh, before then or since. And, but I remember having this intense fear in my heart, laying in bed, drenched in sweat, and all I could think was, is Ruida somehow not going to respond to the gospel message of Jesus Christ? And just, I just kept feeling this fear in my heart 
That that's in, one, in, in some way what I had just witnessed. Uh, and, it, and it terrified me because he's a dear friend of mine. <clears throat> was, was, was he not going to be met for the good news of the gospel? And, it, and the next day I told Jen this dream. And we don't know to this day. Maybe it was just a dream. But what that dream did is it got my family and our coworkers, we started to pray for this man, Ruira. We pray for all the people. We started to pray for this man, uh, especially hard, uh, especially um, earnestly for years. And twice before we got to the Bible teaching, this man nearly died. For all intents and purposes, he should have died for how sick he got. He didn't, and he survived all the way till 2019 to when we started the Bible teaching, and he was among the very first people to repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Today's entire family, his wife and his children, they're all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's alive to this very day. And what I tend to think is the Lord may have given us, given me this dream to get us praying for this man. Prayer is powerful. James, James tells us that the prayers of a righteous man are very powerful. Something like that, paraphrase. It's important to think correctly about prayer. Prayer alone is not something that we wield that has power. The reason why prayer, we can say prayer is powerful is because it is how, it is through prayer that we communicate to Almighty God who has all power. And God is pleased and moved to respond to the prayers of his people and display his power. You can turn your Bibles to Genesis Chapter 20, we're going to look today, we're going to talk today about prayer. We're going to look in the Bible at the very first occurrence of the English translation to pray. And it's found in Genesis chapter 20. There are many different Hebrew words that the Bible translators, there's not many, there's a couple different words, that, Hebrew words that people translate into English to pray or prayed. This morning we're going to be looking in Genesis chapter 20 at the very first occurrence of a particular Hebrew word and the first occurrence of this action to pray. If you know your Bibles, Genesis chapter 20 puts us smack in the middle of the life of Abraham. Uh, Genesis chapter 20, uh, there's quite some story that has taken place within the life of Abraham. Sodom and Gomorrah would have been destroyed by this point. Abraham would have been declared righteous in Genesis 15 uh, when he's having this conversation with God about the stars in the sky and how the descendants of Abraham will be like the stars of the sky and Abraham believes God and he's credited righteousness. Um, at this point in Genesis 20, Abraham would have taken Hagar as his wife. And Ishmael would be born in Genesis chapter 20. God would have already entered into the covenant of circumcision with Abraham. So in, in Genesis chapter 20, um, we find Abraham sojourning in the land of Canaan, specifically in the land of Gerar, where this territory is ruled by a man named Abimelech. And as Abraham and Sarah have done before in Egypt, they, they're, they're sojourning in this land, and Abraham's afraid um, that there's no fear of God in the land, and his wife is very beautiful, and so he tells people, you know, my, my, my wife is my, is my sister, and she tells people my, that Abraham is her brother. And so the king sees how beautiful Sarah is, takes her in to be his wife. And the Lord appears to King Abimelech in a dream. And he says, Abimelech, you're a dead man. Because the woman you have taken belongs to another man. And Abimelech tries to plead his case. He says, in this dream, he says, Lord, 
Didn't he say that she was his sister? Didn't she say that he was her brother? Like, in the integrity of my heart, I, I have done this thing. Are you really going to kill an innocent man? And the Lord tells King Abimelech, he says, I know you did this in the integrity of your heart. And then he says a very interesting thing. He says, but it was I that kept you from sinning against me. It was I that kept you from touching her. Where King Abimelech tries to plead his case and take credit, the Lord says, no, that was me. That was me. And then he tells King Abimelech, he says, Abimelech, return Sarah to Abraham. He is a prophet and he will pray for you so that you may live. And here's the first occurrence of the Hebrew word, palal. <clears throat> palal, which is the, the word that translators, one of the Hebrew words that the translators translate to pray. And as the story goes in Genesis chapter 20, <clears throat> Abimelech wakes up, he tells his servants, they take Sarah, and they go return Sarah to Abraham. And the Bible says that Abraham prays for King Abimelech and his people, Paul all, and they're healed. They're healed. And here's what I want to point out from this story. Here's the takeaway that I want you guys to see. Notice in this story, a man of God, Abraham, is intervening on behalf of King Abimelech through prayer to God. And God hears the prayer of Abraham and he is pleased and moved to act mercifully towards Abimelech and his people and they are healed. There's another story where this, word, this Hebrew word palal is used. It's found in the, in the book of Job. <clears throat> you guys remember the book of Job? I don't want to spend too much time recounting this story. I don't want to run out of time. But you remember Job um, is Satan and, and God have this conversation and, and God gives authority to Satan to do these things to Job and Job wipes out, uh, Satan wipes out everything Job has and then afflicts him with, with boils up and down and Job's sitting in the dust with pottery. He's like scraping the pus out of his boils and he has these three friends that come and we have Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar, and they come, and, and, and I want to give a little bit of credit to these guys. They come and sit with Job for an entire week in silence. That, that is, is quite the testimony of, of, of something as far as their friendship goes, to sit in silence and mourn with this guy for a week. And then they start talking to Job, and, they, and they, they start to say, Job, bad things don't happen to good people for no reason. There must be something in your life. You must have hidden sin. You must have done something to make God angry for this to happen. And Job talks back and they go back and forth. And uh, eventually, we're going to skip over Elihu, which is a very cool character in the Bible. There's a, we taught Job to the Kajay people and there's a little boy named Elihu uh, in, in the tribe as a result of the story of Job. Um, if you don't know the, the story of Elihu and how he fits into the Bible, I encourage you, to read, encourage you to read the story of Job. God eventually comes to Job in a whirlwind, and he has a one-sided conversation with Job. We just ask him question after question after question. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Do you know the way of this or that? Do you know that when, when a doe and a goat give birth in a thicket, I am there? And he has this one-sided conversation with Job. Job is silent at the end of it. The Bible says that Job repented in dust and ashes. And, and then in, in, in Job chapter 42, if you, you can turn there if you want. In Job chapter 42, this is the very end of the story. And this is what I want to talk about real quick. The Lord says to Eliphaz, he says, Eliphaz, my anger burns against you and your two friends. For you have not spoken rightly of me as my servant Job has. And so he tells Eliphaz, you and your two friends, you need to get some, some these, these seven animals, or these animals and those animals, and go make sacrifices. And he says, my servant Job will pray for you. Uh, so, and, you and, and, and I will hear him so that I do not deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken rightly of me the way my servant Job has. And by the way, there's a whole sermon here to talk about how much God cares about being spoken rightly of. 
It's very important to God that he has spoken rightly up, but that's not what this sermon is about this morning. And so these three guys, Eliphaz, Bildad, and, and Zophar, they do, they grab these animals, they go make sacrifices, and at the end of, the, at the end of this section there, the Bible says that the Lord answered Job's prayer. And again, this is what I want you to notice. A man of God intervening on behalf of his three friends through prayer to Almighty God. And God is pleased and moved to respond graciously to Job's three friends. So he did not deal with them according to their folly. God was merciful as a result of Job intervening through prayer to God. There's another story a verse that I want to share with you. Uh, this one we'll read together. You can turn to Ezekiel chapter 22. There's a time in the history of Israel when Judah and Israel are split into two kingdoms and Israel has broken the terms of the covenant. They have become an idolatrous people, perverters of justice. And God is angry with Israel. And he's ready to send destruction upon them. And in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, it says these words. God says, I searched for a man among them who would build up a wall and stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it. But I found none. The land here, if you read the whole chapter, the land here is talking about Israel. So the Lord's saying, I, I look for a man who would build up a wall and stand in the gap in behalf of Israel so that I will not destroy it. But I found none. And the next verse talks about how the Lord sends destruction upon Israel. Notice the fate of Israel when there was no one to intervene on their behalf to God. God sent destruction upon Israel. Consider in your minds for a moment the fate of Abimelech and his kingdom. Had Abraham not intervened with prayer to God for them. Consider in your minds for a moment what the fate of Job's three friends may have been had Job not intervened through prayer to Almighty God for them. I want to suggest that God would have dealt according to their folly and would, and would not have dealt merciful with them. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus says these famous words, verse 37. He says, the harvest is plentiful, the workers or the laborers are few. And he says, pray earnestly, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers into his harvest. And I, I want to ask you guys this morning, you don't, don't answer it, and this is meant to be an encouragement or challenge, depending on, on how the answer finds you. Do you think this church, just in your, in your guys' mind, does it pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out more laborers? And then I want to ask you personally, allow this to be an encouragement, allow this to be a challenge, whatever it should be for you. Do you personally pray earnestly for the Lord to send out harvesters, laborers into the harvest? Remember Israel when there was no one intervening on their behalf? Are you intervening on behalf of the harvest. We should be praying earnestly. It's amazing, the early church reached the known world within almost one generation. 
So that Paul could say at the end of his life that the gospel has reached the, the ends of the earth, the known world to him at that time. You know, 2,000 years later, today, there are still unreached people groups of the world who are yet to hear the message of Jesus Christ. And to me, that, that, I feel like, how can that be 2,000 years later? And I don't know the answer to that. And I do wonder, is the, is the universal church, is, is it not earnestly praying? I don't know the answer to that question. I do know that in Acts chapter 1, it says this about the early church. That they were devoted to prayer. They were devoted to prayer. Man, are we churches, are we people that are devoted to prayer? Are we people that are earnestly intervening on behalf of the lost, of the nations, asking God to reach them, to send people? I think we need to become more devoted. I think we can become more earnest prayers for the lost and for the nations. There's a verse in Ephesians chapter 6 that's going to take talk a, about how we can pray for more than just the harvest and just the nations. You can turn there if you want. I'm turning there in my Bible. Ephesians chapter 6. This is just, just after the armor of God. It's actually part of the armor of God. Verse 18 says, Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, Paul says, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. And so we should be intervening earnestly on behalf of the lost to God through prayer. We should be devoted to prayer and we should be praying for all the saints. And I trust that you guys do pray for one another in this church. And this morning, I'd like to ask you guys, as Paul asked them, to pray for me also. Pray for my family also. And I'd like to give you guys a few things um, that you can be praying for, for our family our, uh, as we looking to go back to Papua New Guinea uh, this summer. And I would, I, would, I would ask you guys to consider praying earnestly uh, for us, for the Kaje people, and and. And, and honestly, you guys, this is what, what and I'll share, I'll share how you can pray for us, but here's how I would really like to challenge or encourage you. Pray earnestly for your missionaries. Get to know your missionaries. Get to know what they're doing. Get to know the people that they're trying to reach. I, I, and I encourage you to be devoted to praying earnestly for the people that they're working among, for the missionaries there. I can't tell you how many times we have been witnesses of the power of prayer among the Kaje people, people group. Um, the Lord is moved to respond when people pray earnestly and people are devoted to prayer. Pray for your missionaries. And I know missionaries, are, uh, we're, we're part of the guilty party and often not letting, letting you guys know or keep you guys informed well in how you can pray. And, and we are part of that conversation. And we need to be better at that. Um, but regardless, I, I do challenge and encourage you guys to try to get to know the missionaries this church is a part of supporting. And consider intervening on their behalf. Intervening on behalf of the people they're working among. So some, way, some ways you guys could be praying for, for Jen and I and for the Kaje people, we are expecting to go back in, in July of this year. Um, and we are expecting to meet, uh, we, there's three families that work there and we are expecting to join up with one of the families there and, and, and work with them to continue the work among the Kaje people. Well, the family that was supposed to be there, when we go back, they had, had to come out in November for, 
for medical problems, and they're going to be out for at least probably a year and a half from now. They will not be returning. Um, our coworkers that are in there now, they've been alone for some time, and they are struggling. It's, it's, hard, it's, it's, it's hard for them and their kids to be alone in there. Um, and their, their plan is to come on, for, come on home assignment, and, then, and we're replacing them. Uh, so we're, we're, we'll be returning, and we're going to be by ourselves in the jungle, which we're not afraid of that, but we do know that we need to be prayed for. And the Kaje people need to be prayed for, um, just that they would continue to, A, grow in their understanding and knowledge of Jesus, and two, that they would start to uh, take more responsibility, step up into responsible roles um, of leadership, and yeah, eventually we want to be working ourselves out of a job. We don't see that happening for some years, but you can be praying for the Kaje in that light. Pray for my wife and our family. It's hard. It's hard to be in the States and, and hear, hear how our coworkers are struggling and they're not spending, they're not able to spend as much tribe time in the tribe for the church as maybe we would like to see them spending. And, that, and, that, and it's hard for us. We think that the Kaje church and the Kaje people and their friends. And so, yeah, I pray especially for my wife. Like she's, she feels like she's, she's often struggling with sadness and she knows that she needs to trust that the Lord is still cares for the Kaje church and, and, he's, and he's doing what's best for them. But you could be praying for Jen uh, in that regard. So those are just some ways you could be praying for our family, for the Kaje people. And this morning, my time is coming to a close, but I've challenged you to consider how you can become more earnest prayers, intervening on behalf of the lost in your communities, thinking about the, the people halfway across the world who still haven't had an opportunity to hear about Jesus, intervening on their behalf, get to know your missionaries, Pray earnestly for your missionaries. Intervene on their behalf and the people that they are working among. Because the Lord is moved and pleased to respond to people when they pray according to his will. And I know we've all seen that in different ways. In closing, I do want to leave you guys, for those of you who may like to, a little bit of homework. If you would like, you don't have to. But if you want to just write down these two Bible passages, this Hebrew word, Paul, all that we looked at this morning, um, as we looked in the life of Abraham and Job and how it relates to intervening on behalf of people through prayer to God. Uh, the, the, this Hebrew word, Paul, all actually has more meaning than that. Um, and it's very fascinating. And you can write down this, this, uh, these two Bible passages Bible passages, Numbers 25, chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. And then you can write down Psalms 106, verses 28 through 31. That's Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 9, and Psalms 106, verses 28 through 31. And it, for those of you who may like to, this is what I think you'd be... Yeah, be blessed by searching Numbers chapter 25 and looking for where in this passage is the Hebrew word Paul being used. And you might have to grab a, a Hebrew something. I use Blue Letter Bible app on my phone. It's very easy to look at those types of things. But I'll help you out. What you're going to find is it doesn't exist in this chapter, Numbers 25. In this section, it's actually not going to be there. But I need you to read that story. You'll jump over to Psalms 106 and look for where this Hebrew word Paulal is being used in Psalms 106. And then make a conclusion about what it means about this word in the way that it's being used there. It's very fascinating. It's going to broaden, I think, the challenge of this message to pray more earnestly and to devote yourself to prayer, it will, it will greaten the challenge, and I think it'll bless you. All right, my time is up. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, we recognize that you are the owner of all things, the giver of life. Lord, I pray that you would 
Uh, Take the words that I've shared this morning from your word, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would help me and my family to um, become better prayers, even more earnest prayers and more devoted prayers than we already are, Lord. Help us to practice what we preach. And Lord, this morning I pray that you would uh, encourage and challenge the, the people here this morning to consider becoming more earnest prayers uh, for the harvest that is plentiful, Lord, that they would perhaps consider becoming more devoted to prayer, to pray for one another, to pray for their missionaries, um, to pray for the world, the, 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 the lost that need you, Lord. Thank you for the way that you do respond to prayer. Thank you for the way that you are moved and pleased um, to, in your great power, respond to us when we pray according to your will. Uh, We see that you are a God who cares. We see that you are a God who loves because we all have testimonies of how you have answered prayers uh, in our lives. And Lord, we thank you for that. Uh, Thank you that we are known by you, that you call us your children. What a blessing and privilege that is. Uh, And Lord, help us to be about Uh, taking your good news to the world and to the lost until you return. So we ask these things in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen.